everyone. Thanks for being here today. My name is Jonah Huviar. Um, I'm one of the co-curators of Prelude 2024 with Jess Barbara Gallo. Um, Prelude is a four-day festival of performances, panels, and artist conversations happening October 16th through 19th here at the CUNY Graduate Center. So we invite you to stay or come back for other events. Um, and Jess and I are both very grateful today to have Nikolai Mishler from Dancers for Palestine and Will Johnson of Theatre Workers for a Ceasefire here with us to talk about their work. There will be a Q&A at the end, so start thinking about your questions now. Um, and this event is also being live streamed for folks at home. So without further ado. Uh, yeah, so uh, first, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being here. Um, Again, I'm Will Johnson, uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a playwright and an organizer with Theater Workers for Ceasefire. Um, and I'm also a longtime member of Jewish Voice for Peace, or over a decade. Um, and uh, it was kind of a natural sort of transition last October when the, um, when the bombing started to move from my Jewish Voice for Peace work into the Theater Workers for Ceasefire stuff. And that's how I started getting involved. Yeah. Um, Thank you also, I'm, I'm Nick Glenn Mishler from Dancers for Palestine, um, and I'm a, a choreographer and director and performance uh, maker, um, and I also have long time been involved with Jewish Voice for Peace um, and organized with them still, um, but similarly, like last October, it just, there, there seemed to be a, um, a need and a gap of, of dancers wanting space to, to um, even just talk about what was happening. Um, and so we, we made this thing and it's sort of grown from there. And before we sort of get into the work that our different groups are doing and doing together, because we um, definitely do work in coalition, um, we collaborate, um, wanted to just kind of take a moment and take stock uh, and sort of acknowledge uh, that you know, over the last year, um, we've been sort of witnessing from afar uh, sort of unprecedented genocidal violence in Gaza. Um, it's expanded into the West Bank and then into Lebanon. Um, and um, when we were prepping for this, we were trying to figure out what to say about that because, you know, um, I think a lot of us in this room probably are aware of the numbers, um, but each week there's kind of a new horror, and even today there are uh, a new series of attacks that went on. So. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to add anything about that in terms of just kind of acknowledging um, what we've been grappling with. Yeah, I think um, something, it's just important to like ground ourselves in um, why we're doing this work and it's, it is for building community in New York and it is for building community as artists, but it's, but it's really about what is happening in Gaza and the West Bank um, and Lebanon. Uh, so. Yeah, it's just, I think it's, it's always important to, to like reground ourselves in that. And then and we're gonna kind of ping pong like this because we thought that would be more fun than listening to one of us for 15 minutes and another for 15. Um, you know, in terms of the why we're doing it, we also wanna talk a little bit about why specifically as art workers and as cultural workers we're doing this. Um, why we would feel the need, you know, as dancers or theater makers uh, to center Palestine in our sort of activism right now. Um, and one of our real goals um, here, it's, it is about, as, as Nikolai just said, it is very much about Gaza and, our, and about Palestine and Lebanon as a whole too. Um, but we're really working to try to build power in the cultural sector right now, um, you know, especially as a sector that's often very much complicit uh, for a long time in the apartheid regime in Israel, and now more recently with the um, genocidal assault that's going on. Um, so we have a real interest in trying to kind of build um, strategically power in the sectors that we work in as artists. Yeah, and um, Will and I both said we're, we were Jewish and we're members of Jewish Voice for Peace, and for me, um, working with Jewish Voice for Peace is, is very powerful and important as a Jewish person that I can I can take my identity and and move it towards a strategic organizing goal um, and I think we both feel the same way about our identity as artists like we are we are um, 
using our identity as artists and our community as artists um, as a strategy, as a, as a tactic to, to organize um, in a broader sense. And, and one thing that, another thing that came up as we were prepping for this and thinking about what we were gonna say in terms of that, our, our sort of work as artists, is the way that power is viewed in the art sometimes, and there can be this kind of vague critique of power as a whole, like power corrupts or power is the problem, and sort of one of the conclusions we've come to in Theater Workers for Ceasefire is that the, actually the problem is that art workers like ourselves and probably many people in the room just don't have enough power, that power is sort of really um, something that we need to have more access to, and so we end up watching things that are happening and feeling like spectators, and like we don't have an impact. And so we're gonna talk more about the organizing that we do, um, but part of also what's inside of that organizing is to try to help art workers understand actually the potential power that we do have, that we're not spectators, um, especially when we, when we organize in coalition. Yeah, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, the difference between organizing and mobilizing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so this is with Dancers for Palestine and Theater Workers for Ceasefire, we do sort of a combination of mobilizing work, um, which, you know, is generally mobilizing is what it sounds like, right? We're putting people in motion. We bring contingents to demonstrations. Um, Dancers for Palestine has done some incredible street actions, um, even just in the last month. Um, you know, we brought people to the rallies on October 5th and marched as theater workers and brought theater workers together for that. So the mobilizing work is that kind of, you know, episodic work that's designed to either disrupt the sort of um, business as usual um, or to draw attention to things that are going on. And then the organizing work that we're doing is more the long-term work that's strategic. And we'll talk in a bit about um, our work with PACB and uh, the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, but we're doing a lot of organizing to try to build support for that in the theater sector and in the dance sector. Yeah, and something you were just talking about before is uh, we're now a year in to this genocide and it, we've been noticing and personally feeling a lot of um, fatigue um, from the work that we've been doing all this year and uh, but also at the same time noticing sort of a, a resurgence and a revitalizing energy that it, it's like a constant wave up and down of fatigue and then revitalizing. Um, and so that, that long-term organizing work is really necessary for us to like make sure that that wave doesn't get stuck on the fatigue and that we can sustain ourselves as, as individuals but also sustain the movement and, and continue working. That's really well said. It's a really good point. We've been talking about hitting plateaus, and so, yeah, doing long-term work is important. And one of the reasons why we think the cultural sector is a really important place to do this organizing is it is actually one of the few places where, right, so the, the, the forces that we're organizing against have access to, you know, military power. They have access to a, a tremendous financial resources, and they also have their own cultural resources and sort of really substantial propaganda machines and, um, media operations, we do not presently have uh, military resources <laughs> and we have extremely limited financial resources, um, but uh, we do have, you know, we have cultural resources. We have both, you know, networks and communities of artists that we can tap into and we also have knowledge of the cultural landscape, it helps us identify potential allies potential targets for campaigns. And so we feel like it's actually an area where there is potential to make progress um, and to exercise our power strategically. Yeah, um, yeah, I, that's exactly right. I think um, it, in any sort of militaristic or imperialistic uh, project, their culture is, is a huge piece of the propaganda, but there's a specific, um, history of that with, with Israel, and they really have like, I would say perfected like using culture and artists as a propaganda tool and, 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 um, and specifically in the dance world, um, there's a huge just like uh, pervasive um, presence of Israeli contemporary dance um, in the international dance world. Um, Batsheva is sort of the most known company, but there's, there's others, and it's, 
it was like specifically designed and created to operate as a propaganda tool, as a normalizing tool of this regime. Um, and as, as dancers, as, as people who are part of the international dance community, it feels really um, like icky that our, our work and our, our fellow dancers are being used as sort of pawns in this, in this way and that we like have a, have a responsibility to actively push against that. And, and the uh, one way that we push against that is by like, like Will said, like using our cultural power um, in opposition. And one of the, I think, one of the ways we know that, you know, we're making some progress is that we're bumping into some obstacles. And one thing that we've talked about um, are the forms of repression that we meet in theater and dance. And I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about what that's looked like in the dance world. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, as I, as I just said, like the pervasiveness of Israeli contemporary dance is really um, felt, I think, by a lot of people. And it's sort of like, you can't get away from it. There's there's um, Batsheva consistently tours internationally, like all the time, everywhere. Um, and uh, th it's hard to, it's hard to um, imagine a contemporary dance world without the Israeli sort of aesthetic as part of it. Um, and also, I think the dance world, sort of separate from Israel specifically, but I think just the dance world in general is very uh, insular and rely, like dancers rely on personal relationships and sort of like individual networking to get jobs. And unless you're like a big time choreographer, like you're relying on someone else to hire you. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure to sort of be neutral or not do anything that's like controversial because you might lose, you, you literally would lose, could lose work. Um, and so it's, I think it's a, it's a sort of an uphill battle to like get dancers to realize that it's worth it to take a stance and to be public and to be brave and to stand together and actually like the more of us that, that do stand together the more powerful it is and the less likely that there will be retaliations. Like if it's just one person, it's easy to say, well, I'm never gonna hire that one person again. But if it's 100 dancers, it's harder to say, we're not gonna hire all of those dancers. Like they have to hire somebody. Um, yeah, if you wanna talk about the similar thing in theater. It, it, can, oh, I, yeah. is it, can I ask a question? Sure. I'm just very curious. Um, I, I'm a theater. I'm a theater person, and I will also pass this mic off to others in the time we have. Um, I'm a theater person. I don't know. I'll, I, I know dance, but I don't know dance as intimately as you do. So when you tell me that, like a company like Batsheva, I want to understand like how a dance company touring functions as a propaganda, which I, which you're suggesting. Yeah. Can you can you fill in that yes, gap? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, and thank you for sort of making me explain that because I forget that not everybody knows everything there is to know. Um, and you shouldn't. There's, there's no reason why you should know it. But uh, so Batsheva was, was uh, formed like in 1948, basically, um, by Baroness Batsheva. Um, and she brought in Martha Graham as the first artistic director. Um, and it was created as the, the first national uh, dance company of Israel. And it still is considered that, um, and it is still fully funded by the Israeli government. Um, and uh, over time has become really a, a powerful, um, important voice in contemporary dance internationally. Um, and is considered one of, the, one of the best dance companies in the world. Um, and so there's, there's one element, the, the literal sense of they are, they are literally funded by the Israeli government. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about BDS, but um, the, the idea of boycott divestment sanctions is that if we refuse to um, give more weight and give more 
uh, capital to the Israeli government, then they have no choice but to make different decisions. And so Batsheva, by, by the company of Batsheva choosing to remain subsidized by this government that is enacting genocide, they are, cho they are actively choosing to support whatever that government is doing. Even if they don't, even if the individual dancers may not, and I'm sure many of them are very critical, but the, the institution is um, continuing to support this government that is breaking countless international laws and, and you know, um, has set up an apartheid state and a genocide. Um, and so that's a very literal sense. And then in a, in a more gray area, there's this idea of normalization that by Batsheva touring internationally and going all around the world, um, sh presenting their dance as Israeli dance creates this sense of, um, of uh, like, it's all gonna be okay, we can just move our bodies. And Batsheva, the aesthetic of Batsheva is very like free and very sort of like loose and, and expressionist and um, it, it creates this image of Israel as a place that is welcoming and that is free and that is fun and it's like we're just moving our bodies, we're just dancing um, while they are funded by a genocidal government. So I don't know if that answers a little bit. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I could ask you a million more questions. Of course, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about similar stuff. Yeah, I feel like there's parallels. I mean, when you brought up normalization, I feel like that's a big thing that in the arts in general as a whole and in dance and theater, right, we're working to combat. And um, we're gonna talk about normalization in terms of BDS later, but also, uh, one of the structures that's similar between, it, I think, among all arts industries is the idea of gatekeepers, which we've always sort of talked about. And I think people usually think about gatekeepers as the people who function to decide who gets what work, who gets a job, who gets a gig. It's purely like thought of as sort of a, their gatekeeper who might serve as an obstacle or an, an asset in building your career. But another function that we've been talking about that the gatekeepers serve is that they actually kind of generate like a dominant ideology in the art by virtue of the things that they decide to fund and not fund. So you have these systems where, right, organizations that are supportive of that kind of, or artists who produce work that's supportive of um, the idea that like if we just have a dialogue then we'll solve this conflict or if we all just, you know, got together and made art then, you know, somehow the genocide would, you know, cease to be. Um, and you see over and over again in sort of progressive or theaters that call themselves progressive. You know, art that's called political art, but its main takeaway is usually something very kind of reductive or individualistic like that. Um, and that's not by accident, that's a function of the way that the pe artistic directors, um, you know, readers, people who are making choices about what's programmed are filtering out art that challenges that kind of thing. And so that I think is very much a, a common, you know, a common structure between dance and, um, and, and theater, and it's, a, it's an obstacle that we're both, I think, working to combat. Yeah, um, and if you, that sort of leads us to like the difference between representation and, and sort of active uh, resistance, and if you wanna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we've, we were talking about it a bunch the other day, and you know, a lot of um, theater orgs right now, I think, are grappling with how do we address what's going on um, in Palestine and, and in Lebanon. And many are, seem to be arriving at, um, at the idea that what we will do is center Palestinian voices or what we will do is center Palestinian stories. And we support that. That is a good thing to do that we support. But um, one, of the, one of the core organizers in theater, Workers for Ceasefire, was talking the other day about how theater people love a yes and and so the idea is kind of like yes we want that representation and i think we need to st take a step further um because you know we've i think we've all seen that you know representation is important and also is doesn't lead necessarily to real structural changes um and i'm sure you see the same kinds of things yeah, in dance. It's, it's very similar in dance and i think um 
it, in dance also there's like with the Batsheva sort of aesthetic of like free movement and and we're all we're gonna solve all the world's problems by like being weird and and moving in a room together. Um, and I think that's also sort of in the world of representation of like we're that's good. We that's great. I would it's it's great to move in a room together with people and feel free in your body and feel connected to other bodies and and connected to the earth and, and all that stuff is is awesome and we want that, but it's not enough. And it's not, um, it, it's not like what, it, it's not organizing. It's, it's making people feel good and making people feel powerful, but it's not actually moving towards like collective liberation uh, in a political sense. Yeah, maybe that's a good, I feel like we've talked about a lot of obstacles and sort of the forces that we're facing. And so maybe we yeah. can talk a little bit about some of the opportunities we see or some of the successes we've experienced. Um, I will say for both of us, I think one real strength of our groups is that we're organizing sort of, we're organizing where we work. Like we're organizing in a landscape that we know. And so like as a theater worker, as a dancer, um, even when our numbers are small, we bring like a disproportionate amount of institutional knowledge of sort of an understanding of who potential allies might be, of where effort would be wasted because there are obstacles that we just don't have the power to combat. And so I think that's been a big, um, I think that's been part of why our groups have been able to grow and been able to attract artists. And I'm sure like, you know, I, it might be a good time to talk about some of the ways in which Dancers for Palestine has kind of use that institutional knowledge to bring people into your actions. Yeah, definitely. So we, Dancers for Palestine started um, in November of last year. We wrote a statement that was essentially like, an op it's an open letter, you can still sign it. It's at dancersforpalestine.wordpress.com. Uh, and it's, it didn't have any specific calls to action. It was basically saying like, we as dancers, stand in solidarity with Palestine. Um, and it's spread around, it now has I think like 2,000-ish signatures, um, and from people signing onto that letter, we got their email. And so then we had built this listserv of people who were at least in some way politically aligned, um, but maybe not like didn't know how to get involved with actions or didn't know, hadn't, hadn't like worked in, in organizing before. Um, and so we took those emails and we, and we sent a template to all those people to send an email to Gibney Dance, um, which is one of the biggest dance uh, hubs in New York City. Um, that it's, they have a resident company and they have open classes and they have rehearsal space and it's just like a giant um, hub for, for dance in New York City. Um, and uh, they, Gibney has, has received funding from the Israeli consulate in the past um, and they also did a tour of Israel last year. Um, and so we sent this template for, for dancers to send to Gibney leadership saying, we as constituents of your community um, do not support the fact that you take money from Israel and, and tour there, and we're asking you to sign PACP, which we'll go over exactly what PACP is, but it's, it's essentially the cultural arm of BDS. Um, so it would mean that they wouldn't be able to take money from Israel anymore, they wouldn't be able to tour there, they wouldn't be able to um, uh, program Batsheva, for example, um, and so we s sent all these letters to them, and they gave a very uh, bland, meaningless response, <laughs> which was maybe expected. Um, and from there, we said, okay, well, if you're going to respond, if, if you're basically not going to respond to your community saying, this is what we want, then we have to escalate. And so we, we took this community of dancers who we, had, who we had brought together in a virtual space and, um, and did a week-long boycott of Gibney open classes and rehearsal space um, with, with in-person pickets. And so we took this virtual 
mobilizing power and, and moved it into a direct action in the streets power with dancers picketing outside of Gibney. Um, and it was really powerful to just be with dancers, be with, with um, you know, people in our community that, that felt like we have, like, yes, we can go to other action, we can go to larger actions and be in, in the streets in other ways, but being together specifically targeting this sort of pillar of our, of our world felt really important. Um, and, and then from there, we just sort of continued and, and have built um, even more of, of that, like in the street power and virtual power. And uh, yeah, I think it's just each, each step sort of adds on to the next and it, it gets, um, uh, every, every escalation is like, a, a, a little win, even if it's it, it's hard to see sometimes in the moment. But like each time we sort of level up and bring a new person in, and and do another action and do another letter or do another like um, Instagram post that gets a lot of likes is like a win. Like we're headed towards a, a direction that is in the direction we want to go. Yeah, and our with the theater workers for ceasefire. Um, I would say our trajectory is really similar. A little, a little bit after Dancers for Palestine put out their statement, we put out a statement. Again, the QR code is up there. And also we realized if you're streaming in, you can go to the websites that are posted up there because the QR codes won't work, but please do go in there and, and sign on to the statements. Um, very quickly got a few, you know, we now have a few thousand um, people who have signed on to our email list, very much the same tactic. But we focused in very, very sort of real kind of laser focus on PACB organizing, which Nikolai just kind of referenced. And so what PACB is, it's the Palestinian campaign for an academic and cultural boycott of Israel. And it's basically the academic and cultural wing of BDS. Um, and uh, it's modeled after the um, South African campaigns against apartheid and apartheid institutions. Um, and so in terms of what that means within the theater uh, industry and within the theater world, um, a couple things we like to clarify for people. Um, it's a campaign that's called for by a coalition of Palestinian organizations. So this is not something we generated here. It's a 20 year old campaign called for by um, a really large coalition of organizations in Palestine. So we're answering a call that originates um, elsewhere. We are not the center of the campaign. We are like offering ourselves in support of this campaign. Um, we also, you know, it's important that it's 20 years old, right? We are, there is like, there are legs to this campaign. It's been going on for a long time. We are not starting from scratch, and we have um, a lot of lessons that people have learned in those decades that we can build on. Um, a couple questions that often come up and that are useful to kind of know with, with PACB, um, we target institutions and not individuals. So it's institutions that are complicit in the apartheid state and the genocide that it's carrying out. Those are what's targeted. We don't target individual artists. The focus is on complicity and not identity. Again, as Nikolai said, as Jewish Voice for Peace members, as people who identify as Jewish, like we are, the, the target is the fact of complicity, not the identity of the institution or the individual. Um, and then there's a principle of gradualism. We're trying to build sustainable victories over the long term, that organizing to build power we talked about before. Last month, um, we had our first wave of endorsements. We got 17 theater organizations to sign on and endorse the PACB campaign, um, which having been involved in this work for a while, I, if you had told me two years ago that we would have 17 groups endorsing, um, I, would have, I would have said, you're nuts, I, I don't believe you. Um, it's, you know, I wanna make it clear, it's not cause for celebration, right? We're not, this is, there's, a lot of work to do, but it is, it's exciting progress kind of along the lines of what Nikolai was talking about, that we're gaining traction, we're building support. Um, and that leads us to, I think, you know, we have ongoing work in these areas and we have actually upcoming events that we would love to tell you about and hopefully see you at. So I don't know if you wanna talk about what you have coming. Yeah, um, so tomorrow, Dancers for Palestine is hosting an event with Samira Skanda. Um, who's going to talk more in detail about PACB and what it means and how um, the dance world, um, sort of the history of PACB in the dance world and how dancers can get involved. 
Um, and then we're also, at that same event, we're gonna have some representatives from the New York Live Arts Union that just formed um, and is unbelievable. Um, and they're gonna talk a little bit about how they formed and, and what, um, you know, organizing in your workplace and what and, and why dancers are workers and why, you know, viewing our ourselves and our work as as labor and as part of the labor movement is really important. Um, and how and how the the work in solidarity with Palestine is connected to the labor work and like we're all working towards the same thing in, in a very um, real way. Um, so we have that tomorrow. And there's information about that on the flyers, I think, and in the QR codes. And then on Sunday. Yeah, and then on Sunday, we have Samira Skanda from the BDS campaign um, doing a teach in from 12 to 2 in Midtown. Um, the information, if you go to the QR codes, either up there or on there, you can find it on the website. Um, it's going to be Samir and uh, Morgan Basikas, who some of you might be familiar with, a performance artist and uh, JVP activist. Um, and it will be very focused on PACB and getting people involved and educated about the PACB campaign. Um, so if you, if you can't come Friday, come Sunday. If you can't come Sunday, maybe go to the Friday. Um, we would love to get more people involved. Um, and I would just say, you know, our work is ongoing and it's, and it's growing. And um, it's really exciting to see the progress we're talking about. And we also like really are looking for more allies. So. Um, you know, please come join us. If Minatsu, who's out there, I want to shout out, has been yeah. one of the real builders of Dancers for Palestine. Um, we've been doing this work together over the last year, and it's been really exciting. We would love to have people come participate and, and help us build power and, and um, stop this genocide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we want to, does anyone have questions? Yes. <laughs> I'll start us off. Um, I have some questions. First of all, thank you both again. Um, yeah, which ones do I want to pick? Uh, uh, I guess I'm curious about um, the kind of like follow up or legacy of the work that you've done around Gibney um, and if uh, that kind of climax of, of action and activity has had tentacles or you know threads that have borne out since then, and, and what the kind of I don't know, ongoing work around that is, um, and also in the conversation around representation and how the yes and of that, like yes, we fully support centering Palestinian voices. We also need to ask you to do more. Is the is the only iteration of do more signing on to BDS, or are there also other um, avenues of action that you're encouraging at the same time? Yeah, um, so quickly I'll just say with Gibney, uh, in full transparency, like they, they are really uh, refusing to engage with us, um, which is sort of expected, but um, we are, we're still trying to engage with them. Uh, um, like, as like the, the Dancers for Palestine organizers are trying to get like in-person personal meetings with the leadership which is one way that, um, you know, is, is a really useful tool of like, it's not just like these random people showing up at your door, it's like we are, we are uh, real people who know what we're talking about and wanna work with you and, and we're actually not, a, a big part of our, our messaging with Gibney is like, we're not trying to isolate you, we actually want to, we're trying to invite you in, we're trying to get to reach some sort of an, an alignment. Um, and because Gibney is so, is so powerful, like, part of our strategy is to, is to show them that if they, if they do reach this alignment with us, if they do sign on to PACB, for example, they will get so much more celebration from their community. Um, because the community right now is very uh, upset with them. Um, so that's still ongoing. And, and then sort of the tentacle of that is the Joyce Theater, which also has taken money from the Israeli consulate. Um, and we've done some in-person actions there as well. Um, but these are, Gibney and Joyce are both like giant institutions that, you know, 
are, are really sort of hard reaches, but they, they are useful for us as organi for organizing our community around. Um, and then the, the smaller tentacles are like the little dance companies that might want to present at Gibney or Joyce or might want to have like a, a choreographer that might want to teach a class at Gibney. Um, and if we bring them in to our organizing and, and use them as like, um, you know, they say, if, if Gibney reaches out to a choreographer and says, we want you to teach a class here, and the choreographer says, I would love to, but first you have to sign PACB, right? That's like a, a, a tool. Um, and as, as Will said, like the, the idea of, of gradualism and incrementalism, that every tiny little dance company that does sign on to PACB then makes it easier for a larger company to sign on. Yeah, and to other ways to plug in, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple that are sort of episodic. So we have been bringing contingents out to the big demonstrations, and it's been a really nice way for, um, for us to meet new theater workers and for theater workers who I think have been feeling that sense of powerlessness and that isolation over the last year, kind of watching things unfold, I think gathering and realizing, oh wow, there's a few dozen other theater people here who I had no idea, maybe this is someone who I worked with on a project and I didn't know they were actually down with the Free Palestine. And it's, it's a really like, it's a, it's a very empowering, kind of thrilling feeling um, to do that, to show up for a rally. We've been doing um, red carpet takeovers um, have been a form of mobilization. So at the Tonys there was a red carpet takeover, sort of like, I wouldn't call it a counter awards ceremony, but it's like a, you know, a, a sort of demonstration to kind of try to draw some attention back to Palestine um, and away from you know, the pomp and circumstance of an award ceremony. But then I would say the, the one that we're most excited about that we're just starting now that we have this first wave. So there's the signing on to PACB, but then once a theater or a theater org signs on, what we're doing now, again, following the example of, of the South African anti-apartheid movement, is we're building a network of what we're, you know, we're sort of calling them apartheid-free zones, which was a thing during that movement in the, in the 80s into the 90s. And so a theater signs on, but then we don't want to just kind of then that's, that's not okay, thanks for signing, by right? It's like now we have this network of apartheid-free zones. Like what does it signify that you and these 16 other theaters have said that? How can we kind of use that so that instead of it just being like a demand we make and then it's over, it's an invitation to a kind of, um, a different kind of theater world and different kind of theater community. What kind of like apartheid-free zone, um, you know, merch can we have? What kind of apartheid-free zone celebrations can we have? How can we advertise the fact that a theater space is actively doing this form of work to reject apartheid and oppression? Um, we're very, that's new because it's, we could only start doing that work once places actually signed on, but we're really excited about it. Other questions? Yeah, thanks so much. This is great to hear about. And I, I work in the arts, and one argument that I often hear in relationship to, you know, um, not only organizing for Palestine, but also like anti, against labor organizing, um, is that, you know, uh, actually arts organizations are in a state of financial crisis, like give me is a good example. And so why, why go after these, these organizations that um, are actually not that powerful and have all these problems? Um, yeah, and obviously the way I'm saying this, I don't agree with that argument, but I'm really curious to hear in your organizing how you address it. Totally, yeah, I think that's, that's a huge um, thing that we hear a lot is like, why go after Gibney? Why go after Joyce? Why, you know? Um, and I think, I think both can be true. Like I think we can hold more nuance in our in our lives and in our world. Um, and it can be true that Gibney is maybe experiencing financial whatever, and and maybe they don't hold so much weight in like a in a they don't hold weight in like a legislative sense, but they do hold weight in the sort of the the ethos of the dance world um, and that is that is equally as important um, and so by by targeting them or by inviting them in we we can use their resources and their um, their power really 
um, for, for our benefit. And when I say our benefit, I mean like the benefit of the movement of, of Palestine and of, and of liberation. Yeah, and I think this is also where that principle of gradualism that Nikolai talked about is really important. You know, um, we're not going after, uh, well, one, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's funny because we are going after theaters, but that language also makes it sound like sort of like hostile. Um, and I think the language of inviting people in is, is, is probably like more akin to the kind of campaign we're actually leading. So if we reach out to the staff at an institution and that's often their first response is like, we are, we are very desperate for funding. If we lose, you know, a few big donors, we might be underwater, you know, that's the beginning of a conversation. All right, you know, we're not gonna say, well, you have to do it now, or, you know, you're, you know, you're on the bad list. Um, then we need to start talking about, okay, well, what would it look like to talk with some of the people on the board who are friendly, right? Because in most of these situations, we were just talking about this, it's very often like you have a board where you have a lot of people who are actually supportive of the idea of joining, and a couple of people who are very hostile to it. And, you know, if we just say, well, this organization's hostile, they said they can't do it because of money, then we lose that conversation. So we try to do some research then and find out what's the actual obstacle. Is a donor threatening to withhold funding? Or are you concerned that that might happen? You know, and so it, it is really, that's the gradualism and the sort of, it's, it's a long conversation we have with these institutions. Um, and we're not trying to, we're trying to meet people where they are. Um, I wonder what y'all think of the role of violence, like um, as far as, you know, what we're up against, it's very violent, right? Power tries to destroy these types of things. And you had mentioned like, the military is against all of this. And so how do you feel about that? Um, you know, I feel I've heard somewhere like capital power is kind of lazy, you know, it doesn't want to work past annihilation kind of a thing. Um, how do you react to that? Or what do you think about the role of violence in this situation particularly? I mean, do you mean specifically in terms of the campaigns we're running, or? Yeah, uh, how, does vi how does violence play in? I know what, how it, it affects, but what do you do maybe in response? I know there's harm reduction, but I don't wanna say, you know, there's a, there's a movement also, I think, with environmentalism, like peaceful, everything has to be peaceful when you're not met with that in return. So how do you react, I guess, to that kind of uh, idea, or the idea is that violence is the answer, I guess? Um, yeah, I can just start by saying the Dancers for Palestine actions, many of them um, have been silent. We've been, done silent pickets, um, and sometimes we have blood hands or poppies um, and just stand outside of the institution as audience or as um, you know, dancers are walking in. Um, and that is sort of a, a physical manifestation of like, we're not gonna engage in rowdiness, if, which is like a stupid word, but um, we're just gonna like be here. We're gonna be present. We're gonna not let you ignore us, but we're also not gonna give you an opportunity to enact violence on us. And the truth is, the police might still enact violence on us either way, um, but we're we're telling our we're we're deciding that the narrative that's going to be shared has to be we are here and we are not engaging in violence and if in, if violence is engaged on us that's on them. That is that sort of an answer? Yeah. yeah. I would also, yeah, I would say along with that, I think that points to, there's another obstacle that we deal with in turning people out sometimes, which is fear. And I think, um, you know, that's where we really try to emphasize like the acting as a collective, right? I think that artists often can kind of default to a sort of individualism and fear brings you into that place too, right? You feel isolated, you feel scared about, you know, the safety of your body, which is real. Um, and so trying to bring a contingent of 35 to 50 people to a demonstration together, right? Or trying to act in concert. Um, because I think what that violence 
that you're talking about or that sort of violent environment leads to is that sense of fear and powerlessness. So all the organizing we do, I think, is around trying to counteract that and get people to feel the power that comes from acting collectively. I know if, um, uh, what's the, there, there's a very specific question I want to ask, and it's about dirty money. And obviously, right, like it's all dirty, you know? So, some, so there's, there's something interesting about like how do you select the demands you make, right? So I would just say is like, a, you know, and I, uh, I think about, you know, art workers are generally precarious in terms of the gigs that they say yes to. So I can imagine sort of, you're talking about A-lister choreographers turning down gigs, right? That's, this is, it could be somebody else, right? But it's like what you have like almost to put on the line. But my question would be like, when you go to a theater's website, like what are you looking for, right? Like I heard you say Israeli consulate. That's super specific. I could look at that. But how, how do you know? Like how do you know this is the worst money? This is, you know what I mean, right? If that, does that question have some sense? Yeah. If, yeah. If you want to get to, yeah. Um, yeah, so the Israeli consulate is, is, as you said, like a very specific identifiable thing. Um, but I think there's also, um, like, you can, do, you can look up who's on the board and what those people might be involved with or where they get their money um, or, um, you know, who they've, who they've um, like, collaborated with or who, like, if, they brought, if they've ever brought Batsheva or another, you know, company that's, fun, like, the the institution itself may not be funded by the Israeli government, but they may be working with, in some network of, of other companies that are. And so there's a, it's a fine line of like second degree boycott, which is, can be confusing, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to note like a, a second degree affiliation is still an affiliation and, and maybe that's a way to sort of um, bring them in. It's like saying, we know you're, you haven't taken money and, that's, and we appreciate that, but we did notice that you worked with this company that has and we wanna talk about what that means and, and you know, why you did that or if you have thoughts, if you have like regrets about that or you know, whatever it is, that's, it's a way to sort of like bring them in. And I would say with that, partly just for the sake of simplicity in terms of we have limited resources, we're a small group, you know, the, our focus is not on secondary boycotts right now, it's on places where we can clearly identify, you know, like BAM had a show last year where you, you had to scroll down a bit, but then you saw the Israeli consulate logo there, right? And so that's, that's an event that we, that is boycottable. Um, the public had a talk back that was organized by the Anti-Defamation League uh, this past winter. Um, that was boycottable. The show itself wasn't funded by the Israeli government. So you could go to the show, but that talk back event specifically was disruptable or boycottable, like it was a viable target. Often they're accepting that money and proud of it and they don't hide it. Like you will often see that Israeli consulate logo pretty prominently featured, but sometimes you do have to do some like, click the links and scroll. Um, and that's some of the work that we're trying to do in our organizations also is do that research. Yeah, and also just to emphasize again, like the, the BDS movement, the PACB uh, movement is not on individuals. So like if you do research and one of the board members is uh, a ferocious Zionist, that's not a necessarily reason to boycott that institution because that one board member might be, have particular opinions um, or give money to Israel. Um, it's, it's about the institution at large and, and what the institution, um, how the institution moves in, in that way. Um, well, I'll just say thanks everybody for coming. Um, thank you both again for joining us. Um, we do have an event at four o'clock um, in just a few minutes in the other theater, the Siegel Theater. Uh, I'm gonna get it right. A Shadow of Light, a ritual gathering with Noel Gusaini. So if you can stay, please join us over in the Siegel Theater shortly. Thank you.